Last May, Vancouver asked the federal government to decriminalize possession of illicit drugs for personal use in that city. Toronto is expected to make a similar request. Just a few years ago, such an idea would have seemed impossible. But here we are. Is it a good idea? Let's debate that with, in Fairfax, Virginia, David Murray. He's former chief scientist and associate deputy director in the U.S. federal government's Office of National Drug Control Policy. He's now a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. And in the downtown core of Ontario's capital city, there's Dr. Quinn McKenzie, CEO of the Wellesley Institute, professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto, and co-chair of Canada's so-called expert task force on substance use. And gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have both of you back on our program. Back in Quam's case, Mr. Murray, for the first time to you. Let me just do a little fact file here off the top to bring everybody up to speed on what's happened over the last couple of years on this file. In July of 2020, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police called on federal lawmakers here to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of illegal drugs for personal consumption. In August of the same year, the Public Prosecution Service of Canada issued a directive asking federal lawyers to avoid prosecuting what they called simple drug possession cases unless there are major public safety concerns and to pursue only, quote unquote, the most serious cases. If we go to 2020 again, there was an Ipsos poll saying that nearly half, 47%, of Canadian respondents supported decriminalization. But if we go to a poll this year by Angus Reid, it showed that 59% of respondents nationally favored removing criminal penalties for possessing small amounts of illicit drugs. So a significant uptick there. Let's get into this. Quam McKenzie, is it time to remove criminal penalties for personal possession of small amounts of drugs that are harder than marijuana? Well, thanks very much for uh, inviting me on, uh, Steve. And uh, just to make it clear, I'm here. I'm not here speaking for the expert task force on uh, substance misuse, but I was one of the co-chairs. Uh, but certainly that uh, group found that um, they believe that simple possession uh, causes harms to Canadians and needs to end. And, this, and Canadians themselves, as you've seen from all of those reports, have said, well, they think it's time to end, to end uh, criminalization for simple possession. They think that the harms that's done, the stigma that's caused, the disproportionate harms for um, uh, racialized and indigenous populations, uh, the fact that it causes burden in getting uh, proper health care, uh, really, uh, and, and actually the cost to the health care and criminal justice system, really mean that it's time that we need to rethink what we're doing in our drug strategies and criminalization uh, seems to be doing more harm than good. That's, that's the general feeling at the moment. Okay, David Murray, your view on this. I'm sorry to think that it's a deep mistake. I would encourage you not to do it. I think uh, the, the illusion is that what's intended, uh, the theory behind this is to eliminate harms and turn into a public health response rather than a criminal justice response. The reality is you're trading one set of challenges, law enforcement, for a severely increased public health crisis. And we've seen this empirically and what you're doing is greatly increasing the risk and the disease burden to the general population as drug use becomes more and more normalized. As more and more people increase, the prevalence rates begin to climb steeply and the overall damage, the burden to society increases incredibly through people's tolerance to everything from morbidities to overdose deaths. And you're also removing one of the most effective tools we have in the public health arena the presence of the law enables the development of drug courts. Drug courts are places where people get into criminal justice difficulty and the judge and a physician and a drug treatment provider can unite and say, we will expunge your criminal penalty if you successfully enter and complete treatment. When you take away decriminalization or with decriminalization, take away the role of the law enforcement system, you've undermined that very capacity to provide sanctioned, supervised treatment one of the best routes for recovery. All right, now that we know both of your positions, let's dive a little deeper. Quam, in your view, what impact has the criminalization of drugs had on drug users? Well, I think that um, we need to be very careful who we're and think about who we're talking about. 
So um, probably about 50% of the Canadian population will have used an illegal drug at some time. Uh, if you look, uh, and uh, thousands and tens of thousands of people are using, are using currently. The, the most common usage is episodic usage and actually the a percentage of people who have any harm from their illicit drug uses is um, probably about 10% according to studies. So the vast majority of people who uh, could be uh, criminalized for simple possession uh, are episodic users who uh, do not have problems due to their substance misuse. Can I just so confirm here, Quinn, you're, you're not talking about marijuana use here. You're talking about harder than marijuana. Well, I'm talking about all drugs. All, all drugs. drugs. Does that include alcohol? Yes. Uh, well, alcohol would, would add another layer as well, right? But yes, I mean, uh, no, I said illicit drugs. Alcohol's not an illicit drug. Gotcha. Right? Okay, illicit. And Very good. Cannabis is not an illicit drug at the moment. So there are lots of people using drugs, and most of them it's episodic use. And if you, and criminalization, of course, means that a lot of people uh, who are uh, sort of using drugs uh, for what they believe is their benefits, uh, but who have no problems, uh, are going to, uh, are possibly going to be criminalized. This is a problem. Uh, there's actually something called, uh, there's a global uh, effort on trying to improve um, uh, drug policies uh, through, uh, and this is uh, the last, one of the last things that Kofi Annan did before he died. And uh, they took experts from all across the world. They, they uh, looked at this across the world, and it was their position that criminalization does more harm than good, and that it, it doesn't actually uh, necessarily uh, help. It makes it uh, is that the war on drugs ends up being the war on people. That was their view. Uh, now, I don't think that these views are need to actually be uh, in opposition, as in it is completely possible to think of ways whereby people can get uh, access to treatment uh, if they want it, because actually treatment works best when it's voluntary. And it's completely possible to try and increase access to treatment. And I think a lot of people would say that that's desirable uh, without people being criminalized. And uh, so I think that uh, it's important not to get stuck in that dichotomy that you uh, either have enforcement uh, of simple possession on if you don't have that, you don't get care. I don't think that's the case. Uh, okay, forgive me, Quam. I'm going to jump in here because uh, time is ticking and I want to make sure I give David Murray a chance to comment on this. Sure. And in doing so, Mr. Murray, um, let me put this quote to you from the Vancouver Police Chief Adam Palmer, who's in favor of decriminalization, who said in July of 2020, if you arrest someone on possession of a drug, that's a very short-term action that doesn't provide any sort of solution. Whereas if we have someone and we can get them into a pathway of treatment, get them proper supports, then you have longer-term benefits. You've heard what Quam has had to say. You've heard what this Vancouver police chief has had to say. How do you respond? Well, honestly, nobody knows the territory you've just sketched out. is unexplored territory. The idea of methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, cocaine being decriminalized, readily available, accessible, and uh, uh, on the streets in a way without intervention is, is unexplored territory, and we're already some degree seeing the ravages of the impact of that on our public health system in the United States, the degree to which we have moved with from marijuana's uh, cannabis capacity to be legalized into poly drug traffickers still present. And what we're seeing is a public health cost that's simply extraordinary in the United States. Nearly 100,000 people a year now are dying from overdoses. And the great majority of those are opioid based. The users themselves get tolerance over time and need more and more until finally they degrade their health to such a degree that they either die or the morbidities are so high. The cost to the public health system is extraordinary. And the damage to the individuals and the loss of a generation is something we have to seriously entertain here as the prevalence rate climbs so steeply. Here's another dimension. 
Most drug users who are in serious drug use patterns intensify over time. And it's over time that we began to see the ravages showing up. And they use multiple drugs simultaneously. So the same people who are overdosing on prescription drugs have on board at the time of their crisis illicit cocaine, illicit uh, opioids such as fentanyl, illicit benzodiazepine taken, taken inappropriately. They're poly drug users. And the crisis becomes when you decriminalize, you may have an acceptable level of provision of the, the drug through, say, cannabis, through uh, Canada itself providing some legal access to cannabis, but you also have the black market. It is not driven out. It is still present and it capitalizes on the increased prevalence and on the increased in intensification of the drug user's needs. So you still got a contaminated, dangerous, violent, coercive black market trafficking operation going on outside. At the same time, you're trying to say to people, possess drugs, use them, and we won't interfere with you. You're, you're igniting a real uh, genuine conflagration. Can, Quam, can I get you to respond to that? Yeah, I think that most people would say that uh, decriminalization goes with uh, increased access to uh, supports, uh, maybe regulation and safer supply of drugs. Uh, so there's a whole number of things you have to put in place. And so uh, the truth is that uh, the way we're going, uh, the criminalization has not worked. Uh, we have seen rising deaths. Uh, we have seen um, sort of use on the increase. And so um, usually when we have a social policy strategy which hasn't worked, the best thing to do is to try and rethink. We're talking about 5,000 deaths, just from opioids, 5,000 deaths a year in uh, Canada. And I think most people and most Canadians are now saying we need to rethink and we need to work out whether if we believe that people have an illness, that then making them criminals for their illness is the right way of going. But I guess the question well, that... Can I just uh, interrupt for a moment, please? Excuse yeah. me. I just wanted to respond please. to the professor's commentary here. What, what one sees is you can contain and limit the damage. We still have forest fires. We still have pathologies of society, but we try to limit the extent of them and the total burden of them on society. And you have to have a criminal justice capacity to be able to say trafficking and possession and use have dimensions that are so injurious to the people we're trying to protect and save and to recovery that we have to have some dimension of being able to leverage the circumstance we can't simply give in and yield to what is highly dangerous. And the, the reality is, including in Canada, the, the precincts, the provinces, the cities that have the worst of the overdose crisis and the strongest impact on my marginalized communities, on the indigenous, are places like British Columbia and Vancouver, where the most progressive policies, the most ready access, even the provision of very powerful opiates proposed through vending machines. This is not an access to treatment. This doesn't get people into health and recovery. These are simply rolling over and enabling widespread disaster on the city streets. And they have higher rates anywhere in the Western world, in Vancouver, of, of overdose deaths and morbidities associated with the availability, access, and normalization of the drug access. And if you do this over a generation, the upcoming generation loses its prevention and deterrence capacity. It normalizes the presence of the drugs, and it deeply embeds the illicit nature of this into coercive and corrupt fashion that begins to actually erode the government. It becomes a cancer. And it seems to me that the most compassionate thing a physician needs to do in the presence of a cancer is to operate and to provide chemotherapy. And the patient has to discover that there can be a great deal of pain associated with that, but it is also the chance to save that life. We can't simply give in. And decriminalization strikes me as trying to make a deal to bargain with a cancer. Okay. Quam, you've heard the argument. You want to come back on that? Yeah, I think that uh, I can completely understand where um, uh, where you're coming from. I, I mean, obviously, I have a different view. Uh, I do think it's important to, to remember that when people are talking about decriminalization, they're talking about decriminalization 
of uh, a possession of small amounts uh, for personal use. Uh, and that doesn't mean that people are going to stop look at uh, sort of drug trafficking. That doesn't mean that all of the work that the criminal justice system is trying to do to find um, sort of or to, to work against organized crime, it doesn't mean any of that goes away. This is just saying if you as a person have a, a sort of a, possess a small amount of drugs, you're not going to end up criminalized. Uh, and I do think that it is, it is possible to be thinking about how regulation or even supply of safe amounts of uh, drug uh, can over a period of time decrease the levels of use. And uh, the uh, Global Commission on Drug Policy, uh, the work that I was talking about by Kofi Annan and, co and colleagues, uh, that's what they said. They said you do actually have to try to control supply, regulate supply in order to save people because otherwise you end up with the situation that we have where our, um, uh, our war on drugs has led to uh, more and more uh, sort of toxic, volatile supply that is killing people. And if we want to stop people dying, we have to work on how we can get that done. And Canadians and Canadian policymakers, whether it's the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, expert task force and many others have come to the conclusion that the evidence-based way forward is to think about decriminalization. Well, let me I put some evidence. This notion let, of a safe me... drug supply is another illusion and a striking illusion. A safe drug supply, after all, you may recall that we had a crisis beginning here with opioids in the United States with OxyContin. Pharmaceutically grade safe, regulated by prescription from a physician through a licensed pharmacy, and yet it led to thousands of overdoses and the ignition of a crisis that is with us still that also operated in the context of an unrestrained black market okay. still D present. David Murray, let me jump in here. There is no safe methamphetamine over time. It decays and degrades the capacity of the person to maintain their rationality and their health and well-being. I know you there both is no want safe level. And I know you both want to argue empirically provable pack, facts. So let me see if I can get some of those on the record right now and then get you to comment. Because 20 years ago, apparently Portugal became the first com uh, country to decriminalize uh, possession and consumption of all illicit substances. And we fast forward 20 years, apparently HIV infection plummeted from an all-time high in 2000 of 104.2 uh, new cases per million to 4.2 cases per million in 2015. Does the experience, David, I'll go to you first on this, does the experience right. of Portugal not suggest that decriminalization can work. It maybe it can for Portugal. I think there's a great deal of misunderstanding as to what exactly has transpired in Portugal. They still have very strong laws, mandates, and rules regarding the possession and use of drugs. What they have done is to take the criminal justice system to one side, but they're basically operating with a system that's much more like what I was describing as drug courts. People are remanded if they have more than the drug that they're supposed to have. If they have addictive patterns of behavior, they are, in fact, uh, uh, brought before magistrates and put into a context of considerable social pressure to get treatment and get care of their pattern of drug abuse. What is problematic is that there are 10 million people in Portugal. It's a small, conservative, tight-knit community, and it has families that are intact and well-known community structures. We have 10 million people in Los Angeles County alone. And what we're seeing in San Francisco with degrading homeless people who are suffering greatly and need help and outreach and prevention and protection, they are unlike what we find in Portugal. Okay, Portugal so let me get to Quam then. uses family to coerce, shape, normalize, and help those who have a serious drug abuse problem. Okay. We do not have that level of civil society. Okay, Quam, maybe the Portuguese example is not helpful to Canada then, after all? Well, actually, um, some people would say that um, Canada is more like Portugal than it is like the USA, right? So uh, I think we'd have to look at that. But there are 30 countries around the world who uh, have gone the path of either never criminalizing or decriminalizing. So there are a number of different case studies to look at. And uh, yes, it does take a whole community approach 
uh, to uh, move things forward. But I do think it's important to remember we've got here as Canadians, and that's why, uh, because people are completely clear that what we're doing at the moment doesn't work, the criminalization doesn't work, and we have to think in a new way if we're going to save lives. And uh, I completely understand where David's coming, completely from a position of compassion, completely understand uh, his position, but I don't believe that that is uh, what will work in Canada. And I believe that the evidence in Canada is that, yes, we do need to take the hard road of thinking about how we um, decriminalize and how we significantly increase the supports that are available uh, for people who use drugs. Well, let me do a quick follow with you on that, Quam, and that is Vancouver has gone down this road already. Toronto is thinking about it. What have we learned from the Vancouver experience that might be applicable here? Well, Vancouver have applied. They haven't actually got their um, application through, so they haven't actually gone through and uh, started all of this. The police themselves have decided that they are uh, going to change the way they deal with uh, substance misuse because they found that the previous way they were used of doing it was ineffective. Um, I do think whatever we do needs to be properly uh, looked at and evaluated. We have to take, uh, we have to make sure it works, but we have to make sure it works for everybody because uh, we need to listen to uh, Indigenous peoples and uh, look at the models that they think are going to work for Indigenous peoples. And we have to look at uh, racialized populations, in this, especially the black population, and work with communities to look at the models that they think will work for them. Because we're in a crisis now, and we have to think differently in order to um, get better outcomes, because uh, people are dying and uh, families are being moved. David Murray, let me ask you this. You, you've spent basically your whole professional life taking a particular approach to this issue, and you have passionately argued your case on our program here tonight. Do you think that makes it more difficult for you to consider that there may be a new and better approach to this um, and, and that you need to consider that? What do you think? I consider it all the time. Matter of fact, as part of my intellectual training, my background, and I think it's a calling to think carefully. What have we done? What can we learn? What can we do better? And can we reform many of our drug policy interventions? Absolutely. However, when you see someone about to make a mistake that you can identify with clarity is going to make things potentially worse. And in fact, the evidence seems to show you're taking a bad situation and in fact, in strengthening its power over us. These are not the pathways of wisdom to say people should have access to hard drugs and it should be decriminalized. We basically have substances that are but a tenth to a hundredth of the prevalence that they would be if they were decriminalized. Alcohol is very, very widespread in American life because it's legal basically for anybody who's an adult. The number of users is multiples over the number of users of illicit drugs. Every year that we have seen decriminalization and illegalization of recreational marijuana in the various states, we have seen a six to eight percent growth per year in prevalence and intensification of use by youth, and thereby also a spillover into the other drug using circumstances with meth, cocaine, opioids, and the rest. It preconditions and strengthens the black market's capacity to deliver those substances now. My impression would be, and I think Wisdom suggests to us on the nature of human beings, if they are able to have access as a, at a young age when they're still developing to hard drugs and or even high potency marijuana, the psychosis, the schizophrenia, the despair, the loss of life that we are experiencing now can in fact be made worse as a fire can be flamed by, by greater wind and or our incapacity to respond to it in the hopes that it will simply die down. My impression is that's illusory. And the evidence we have to date is that we can make a mistake and make it worse. Gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for coming onto our program tonight and having such a passionate yet civilized debate about a subject that I know you both care so much about. Quam McKenzie from the Wellesley Institute, who got the first word. David Murray from the Hudson Institute, who got the last word. 
Thank Great you, to sir. have both of you on our program tonight. Thank you. Indeed. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.